I'm Pam Lundell, and this is A Widow's Heart. Okay, welcome to uh, another episode of A Widow's Heart. <laughs> My guest is Jackie Skog, who is a Christian counselor. Welcome, Jackie. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you, Pam. I feel like we we have a friendship because I hear you every morning on the radio. So, <laughs> But this is only the second time we've really met. And oh. thank you so much for having yeah. me here and wanting to hear a story. Well, God has um, blessed me uh, to just have amazing people like you, unfortunately, mm-hmm. who have lost their spouse. But... The stories of how God has worked in your life, through Mm -hmm. my life, all of my guests so far are so encouraging. And I think as widows, that's what we do best. You know, it's a terrible thing to go through, Mm -hmm. but we can walk alongside those other widows. And I think we're going to be amazed with your story and what you've been doing, how God's been working in your life Mm -hmm. since the death of your beloved husband. So I'm going to get out of my own way here and and let you tell me about about your guy. My husband's name was Glenn Skogon, but he went as Buster. Um, He was (laughs) named that before he was born because he was the sixth of eight children. He's a rather large baby and at 10 pounds and 24 inches. So he he was quite a bump in his mother's stomach and the older kids would always laugh and say, he's busting <laughs> out. So that was a story about how he got his, his nickname, oh, I love that. Buster. So he's known more as um, Buster than Glenn. Um, it's interesting that um, I was somewhat prepared. I had sort of an idea that I would be alone someday because he'd been sick since 1996 and he actually died August 10th of 2015. But there was a open heart surgery to where the cardiologist said, you are the luckiest man alive. Wow. Your wife should have found you dead on the garage floor. Oh. And I took that in very seriously because I'd sort of had a premonition that he wasn't in good health. Um, <clears throat> so At any rate, that was 1996, and we had, you know, until 2015, but he had had um, cancer, heart disease, he was pre-diabetic, and at the time, he had beat cancer, which was a grueling experience of radiation and chemo that really slowed our life Mm -hmm. down big time, slowed him down physically. He was a rather strong man, big man, and could do anything, literally, um, we always said, you say buster, he says fixed. And so <laughs> <laughs> he would fix just about anything, even if he didn't know how. But um, he lost his strength toward the end. He was having all kinds of bouts with different things, flus and headaches and um, all just a lot of infection in his body. But the day he died, I was not prepared for what I was to come home to. And whoever is. <laughs> Whoever is, mm. that's right. So I'd been at work, um, and I came come home about nine o'clock at night, and he didn't answer the front door, and that's odd. He usually answered the Unusual. front door, mm-hmm. had it unlocked, and had dinner ready for me. Wow! <laughs> yeah, I was very fortunate. He did almost all the cooking. Aww. He retired in two thousand, so he had quite a bit of time on his own as a retired um, police captain. Um, where, was, where was he, uh, police captain? He was police captain for City of Blaine. Okay. He spent Blaine, 26 Minnesota. Okay. years there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when he didn't answer the door, I thought, oh, he's probably sleeping. So I go up the back steps in the garage and I open the back door and I saw him on the floor in the living room at the top mm. of the stairs. And I ran over to him and I said, Buster, wake up. And he didn't move at all. Um, and so my son was downstairs. He had the downstairs door closed. He and his daughter were watching a, a movie downstairs. Mm-hmm. And so I hollered to my son. I said, Dad's not breathing. And he jumped up, literally jumped off the couch, ran upstairs. And he said, call 911. So I did. And they were there in just a very, very few minutes. Mark mm-hmm. tried valiantly. Oh, honey. This is why we have Kleenex here. Yeah, he tried valiantly. We cried out, Daddy, wake up, wake up. And he didn't wake up. Um, EMTs, the house was filled with about 30 people in under 15 minutes because we live close to the police station. And so Spring Lake Park, where we live, Blaine, Anoka, Sheriff's Department, um, they were all there. Firefighter that came um, to administer what, was the only thing they could do, defibrillator and shots, was our neighbor boy. He was a volunteer firefighter, and he was the one doing the work, which 
my mother heart felt for him because he'd been part of our youngest son, Ryan's life. And he'd been at our front door many times, but not in this way. It doesn't matter how many years go by, does it? No. It's just so so close. Yeah. You relive the trauma. So Uh. um, I, I said, I was standing in the kitchen, which was right adjacent to where my husband was lying down. And I said to the lead firefighter, um, how long will you do this? And he turned to me and he said, after 20 minutes, nothing really happens. He said, I I think you need to go downstairs. Well, I couldn't get downstairs the way my husband was at the top of the stairs. So he pretty much escorted me downstairs. He was followed by Anoka County Sheriff's deputy, very, very nice man. And he's, he's saying to us, no, this is really tragic and it's really traumatic. And it was a blur. It was like, you know, he was talking, I could hear words, but They weren't registering. And I said, well, we'll be okay. You know, we'll be, we'll be all right. I'm a Christian counselor. He says, well, funny you say that. Sometimes these are the hardest things to deal with when it's your loved one. And I was somewhat offended. Mm. I I thought that didn't feel appropriate for him to say, but it was. And he was, yeah, he followed me then into another room and he said, no, he said, you need to take care of yourself. And of course, I was concerned with my son. His five-year-old daughter was there. We didn't At know that what she point. Saw. It's it's just happening. It's yeah. still happening. Still yeah. happening. And it's like I can't even begin to take care of myself yet. Yes. <laughs> oh. So we stood downstairs for a little while. Um, we knew that they were still working on my husband. And then I heard my son go into other one of the other rooms and call his brothers, two of his brothers, um, Eric and Ryan, who were on vacation. They were both on vacation with their oh, families. The worst. Yeah. And he had to call them and say what he didn't want to say doesn't look good. Mm-hmm. You know, and then he called my husband's sister, who was a Franciscan nun. And of course she mobilized every prayer warrior that she could, thinking that maybe, maybe there's a chance. Yeah. So uh, probably ten minutes later, down comes our neighbor boy, firefighter, to say <laughs> Jackie, I'm sorry to tell you, but he died with his boots on, which is a familiar saying because I remember my husband coming home from incidents on work at work that he would say the same thing. He said, the poor guy died with his boots on. Aww. And whereas it was somewhat comforting, too, it again was, okay, okay, I have to adjust. What does that mean? You know, so I was more concerned about my son, Mark, and his daughter because she was five and we didn't know what she'd seen in all of it. And and so we were comforting her and then trying to think about, okay, who to call. Um, First of all, I had to wait until the body was gone. And there were two police officers. It's it's just incomprehensible when you are in that in that moment, in that time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So there were two Spring Lake Park police officers, just wonderful guys who stood with me um, until the gentleman came from the mortuary to pick him up. And then it was, well, where is he going to go? We never talked about it. And I know Pat Miles had said that in a previous podcast. We had never talked about any of this. So I made a decision based on um, a funeral that I'd just been to, and that turned out okay. It turned out really well. But we did have to wait for someone from the coroner's office to come. And it was a former colleague of my husband's. They'd been on a uh, police force together. They'd worked together. So I, again, I have so many questions to ask you. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt. We're talking with Jackie Skog, Christian counselor here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. But it, I just kind of feel the love in the midst of the tragedy with that fraternity of police yeah. officers and I'm, I'm going to need a Kleenex and, and the firefighters that surrounded you like, like angels almost, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In <laughs> very much. So <clears throat> they were so respectful and, and so um, they weren't all familiar. I have to say that many of them I'd never seen some he'd hired actually, yeah. and had remembered him. <laughs> and later on that night, we got a phone call from, <clears throat> a, a guy that he had mentored, so to speak, just a, a fun guy. <laughs> I can't even repeat what he said to me, but <laughs> I'll tell you that he said, he said, I love that guy. He was a blankety blank blank, but I really love the guy. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you know what? Here on a Widow's Heart podcast, I love how we cry and we laugh. <laughs> and remembering, you know, those 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 memories whenever anyone comes up and tells us the story. Just do that if you know someone who has lost their spouse. So I'm go con- continue. And also, I just wanted to mention too. That's what I I love about this podcast, A Widow's Heart. I don't require you to share your story, and you can only share as much as you want or as little mm-hmm. as you want. But it's like a like a sacred sorority of of yeah. of sisters, and that's what widows do. We can tell mm-hmm. each other things that we wouldn't tell anyone outside of our family. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah, the understanding is there. <clears throat> um, I have to say that this morning I thought my one son Ryan always tells me, Mom, try not to be funny because you're really not funny. You just can't pull it off, Mom. <laughs> That's his opinion. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought of something this morning that might really be humorous to another widow. Yes. And maybe right only ahead. to widows. Um, but I love this statement um, that the Lord gave me this morning. He said, you know, when we talk about widowhood, we often talk about it in a jest because there are sports widows, there are fishing hunting widows, widows, hunting yes. widows, fishing widows, work widows, and we kind of, you know, chalk it off as a little bit of humor and maybe some understanding, but this is the one widow that we talk about that we we whisper, we don't talk proudly about it until we've done our work. And then we do, because I remember as I a child, that. yeah, have you felt that too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, God is at work, but I just had to, I often say, just get out of my own way, go through it, yes. you know, before you can actually see what the, what the end plan is, you know? Yeah. Right. Well, I think, you know, you, you become a widow by no efforts of your own. Unless, of course, the unthinkable happens, but we're not talking about that. (laughs) Um, So you become an unmarried person. And I felt like I had to awaken to that. I had to awaken to the fact that I'm no longer married. In the work that I do in my counseling office, I talk a lot about your personal identity in Christ. And until I was widowed, I didn't understand how much of my identity was really around being a wife and a mother and how little I really had explored the depth of who I am to God. So 13 Mm. times as I sat, I sat up that night and I I couldn't sleep. And so I planned his funeral. That same evening? Yeah. Overnight? Overnight. Wow. Mm. They picked him up at about midnight, and then I I couldn't sleep. I was just so wide awake. No. It's like, how can I? Mm-hmm. How can I? I, mm-hmm. I was right there. Yep. Yeah. So you then picked out the songs that he liked and um, thought about who I would want for a pastor. And so we tried three people, and nobody was available. I thought, well, I can't do it. I know I can't do it. But then God planted in um, in this whole scenario the pastor who had done visitation in the hospital when he had open heart surgery in 96. He was available. Everybody else was on vacation. August, a lot of pastors go on vacation. Perfect fit. He remembered us. He remembered the meaning of the name. And he remembered my husband. And that was so sweet and personal. Yeah. Very, very nice. And he did a great job. Um, And all my sons spoke. They did a beautiful job in speaking. I was so, so proud of them. And I think I couldn't speak. I, I just couldn't. I knew that I'd blubber, and that is the worst thing I want to do in public is right. to sob my heart out. I, I think, Jackie, that people would understand, but of it's course. your choice, and you made your choice, so that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So they did well without me. <clears throat> I think that as I I was asking God, how then shall I live, 13 times he brought me to Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans for hope and a future. Yes. And I didn't know what that was. But after the 13th time, I thought, well, he must be really serious about this. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, and how beautiful that is. You yeah. know, I, I heard it on a, many sermons that I was listening to on grief and a lot of places that I would go, the topics would surround, you know, living well, and and that was it. But I've really been lately attracted to the widow's might and Psalm 139. 
and I'm doing a bit of writing on Psalm 139 to kind of tell the story of my life and and how it how it was to live as the daughter, the sister, the wife, and the mother of U.S. Marines, mm-hmm. and how a war comes home, and how the war at home is something that many people like me, widows, and people who are, whose spouses are still alive, deal with day to day. So I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Okay, good. But to awaken to widowhood was like you said too, Pam, earlier. We don't necessarily want that title, but we're here and it's yeah. there. And and we have to find a way. I had to find a way to embrace. So whereas I've dealt with all kinds of grief in people's lives, um, dealing with people in the shelter. I work for the Dwelling Place Shelter as well. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And there's living grief there. Um, a lot of people. Living grief. That mm-hmm. is quite a phrase. Yeah. yeah. Very much so. And then, you know, for I have dealt with a lot of widows, widowers in my practice and talked them through early stages of grief and all of that. But it's messy and it doesn't go linear. Okay, we're talking with Jackie Skog, who is my guest on A Widow's Heart. I'm Pam Lundell. Your card I have in front of me says peace and safety. Mm -hmm. And you were a Christian counselor before your beloved Buster went Mm -hmm. to heaven. Right. How long before you went back into practice? Um, mm-hmm. How did your losing your spouse, becoming a mm-hmm. widow, affect your grief practice? Mm, hugely, hugely. So I think I was gone two to three weeks. It wasn't nearly long enough. I was still kind of a puddly mess. Um, <clears throat> and I, I should have taken longer. I should have taken a couple of months to really sink into what it all meant. Because there's secondary losses. Like I said, he was a big, strong man, and all the housework and all the things that he did, mowing the lawn and all of that, um, those were things that I had to learn how to do or pay for. Did you have anyone at home then at that time? My one son was there, and he did a lot of the stuff for the first yeah. about year or so. And he was great, and they've all been great. My my kids have been a great source, and so have their spouses as well as the grandkids and the great-grandkids. I got great-grandkids now, oh. too. So I'm one of the older widows that you talked about. <laughs> I'm not 85 yet, but I'm one of the older widows. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. I mean, you, so you heard you heard that story, too, yeah. because my, my grief journey brought me to a grief class, and like I said, I couldn't believe that at that time. I'm older now, but at that time, I thought, well, well, how am I going to do this with these women who are 30 years older than me and, yeah. you know, whatever. But, you know, and then, then I ate my own words because it was a beautiful experience and mm-hmm. God sent them to me. Yes. yes. To, to lean on each other and learn from each other. You know, I feel the same way about younger widows, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I was 70 when I was widowed. And honestly, the younger widows have a different perspective. And we do see quite a few. I do a grief share program at my church with my pastor, Sandy. and we do see an awful lot of young women who are widowed COVID for yeah. sure. Industrial accidents, um, illness, cancer has been a big deal, but I'm amazed. A lot of them have kids, you know, which is a whole nother yeah. thing. My kids are grown, but that is the resilience in women as widow. I think that it opens a bit of creativity that maybe we didn't tap into. It was always there, but we just didn't have handle on it. And you mentioned Jackie earlier about things that your husband did because you were mm-hmm. you were spoiled. I <laughs> you was. Had, you had a great one there, cooking yeah. meals and things like that. And I was alone with with two adult children out of the house when John passed away. And I, I've shared these different stories many times, but I remember thinking to myself, um, it was August. Um, 20 of 22, when was it? 2005. <laughs> That's how long, long ago it was. Um, but as the fall came and winter came, uh, my brother-in-law would come over and plow the snow. Mm-hmm. And about the third time, because we had a plow, but John used to do that. Yeah. He came over, he said, Pam, get over here. I'm going to show you how to start this thing. Ah. I'm going to show you how to do it. He's going to teach me how to fish. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want, I want you to do it for me. But, uh. but then I find these reserves inside of myself that I can do these things. Yeah. And if I can't, I, I, I could go online and go to YouTube or call and, and take control and ask questions. Number one, because you have to. Yes. 
but also, you know, you're stronger than you think. You are. I know. know. The first time I thought, okay, I can do this was my doorbell went out. And so I thought, well, go buy a doorbell. It can't be that hard. I'll go buy a doorbell. (laughs) Yeah, is that what we do? (laughs) Go to the doorbell store? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I went to Home Depot. I found a doorbell and it was only two wires. I managed it. I was so proud of myself. Nobody else was, but I was proud of myself. And then um, that winter, the (laughs) snowplow um, mowed down our pole for our mailbox. (laughs) Oh, goodness. And and I was trying to get somebody to do it. Nobody ever had time. So in May, the post office has been holding my mail. This was like, I want to say early January that it got mowed down. And finally in May, the post office said, can you please get a box? So I thought, all right, I'll figure out how to do it. So I learned how to pour cement. <laughs> you did not. Put in a pole to the amusement of the neighbors who watched me do it, which was really funny. Shame on them. They should have been over there. <laughs> it was a good It was experience. quite a sight, right? Yeah, it was quite a sight. But I figured I might as well try it. What, can, what harm can be done. So we talk about a widow's resume. In grief share and how it changes. Now I have doorbell installation and um, mailbox installation. I can paint now. I can repair. I have my own toolkit, which I never had. Oh, my goodness. You've got a Batman utility belt. (laughs) About that. Yep. (laughs) Oh, Jackie Skog, my guest, a Christian counselor um, on a widow's heart. This is episode, what episode is this? 17. I'm going to take a a break real quick because I want to tell you about... um, um, Wings for Widows. We have a sponsor of A Widow's Heart, and it's called Wings for Widows. And Jackie, I'm wondering, do, have you heard of them? Yes, I have. Yeah. Incredible organization. We're so thankful for their support of this podcast. And I just want to reiterate that it is um, some incredibly special Christian uh, lawyers and uh, professionals who want to come alongside you, widows and widowers, and help you with your finances. They're not there to try to get your money to invest. Mm -hmm. They help with bankruptcies. They help if you have millions of dollars. They want you to make the right decisions. Because when I was a first widow, I wish I had known about Wings for Widows because I just had no idea Mm -hmm. what was going on financially. And um, I did not want to be taken advantage of financially in the future by anyone. So I just wanted to tell you, Jackie, about that and also our our listeners and Wings for Widows ready to answer your question. You can Mm -hmm. check out their website at wingsforwidows.org. Wow, what a great resource. I know. Mm. I, I love them, and, and it's so great. They put on the Hope Fest here in the Twin Cities, a uh, great Christian mm. uh, music concert, and hope they're going to do it again um, this year. But now we are back to you learning your independency, and I love how you're um, weaving in your expertise as a as a Christian counselor mm. in this as well, and, and your grief share work. Yeah. Jackie, that's amazing. I enjoy it very much. Never thought I would. Although, like I said, grief comes in many forms. And sometimes it's when a marriage ends, but the couple stays together. Mm -hmm. So there's that kind of leaving. And then there's the grieving of deception, you know, when you know something's going on and the marriage just isn't what it was. So um, there's that kind of leaving. Divorce, obviously, is, is a very difficult time for people. So we can be alone and still married. And that can be a difficult time too. Um, what I found in what I'm calling this stage of my life is my repurposed purposeful life. So good. (laughs) Is that the name of your book? No, that's not, not, well, maybe later on, but I'll get the first one out first. But where I glean this from is as a 17 year old, um, I was elected the head of a YWCA group in my my school. I went to Roosevelt High School and we had a a club called Blue Triangle. And so somehow I was elected president. um, Miraculously. Somehow. Oh my gosh, you'd be my first choice. (laughs) Well, I was, I thought an unlikely candidate, but I had a really good campaign manager and bless her heart. She did a really good job. So that summer between my junior and senior year, I had to go to a leadership conference and the speaker was Pastor Jim Hurdy. And he had two daughters about our age. And he led this conference about us being women leaders. This was 1963. Okay. So that's progressive. Progressive. He he said, ladies, don't let anybody tell you this just because you're a woman, you can't lead. He said, you lead with your heart and your head. 
and I thought, what great inspiration, you know. Um, I didn't have a dad at home. My dad was mentally ill, and he was institutionalized. So I didn't have a daddy at oh home to tell me anything about anything. So this, I just, I listened to his every word. But I want to tell you the very last word that was said in the chapel at the um, Lutheran Bible Camp in Spicer, Minnesota. And that plays into my life later on, which I'll tell you about too. But he said the very last thing was, ladies, live your life so that that at the end of your life, it ends with a bang and not a whimper. <laughs> and I was Okay, so... I'm gonna, we're going to have t-shirts made. <laughs> <laughs> live your life. With purpose, so that at the end of your life, it ends with a bang and not a whimper. I hope that encourages so many right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I decided that I could whimper alone. Sure can. uh, And do at times whimper and whine. But I also could be in awe of what I have. And the widow's might plays in here because I think she gave all she had yeah. And look what happened. I call it the mighty might story because mm-hmm. from time and eternity, she is remembered for giving her all. Yeah. And this is how I see the awesome power of God inhabiting our life at any stage, whether we wound up there on our own by mistake or purposefully, we don't ever need to forget that God has an awesome power in our lives and he has an awesome purpose for us all. I think Mother Teresa is the one I like to quote on this, where she said, we may not all be able to do great things, but we do small things with great love. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the journey that I think I'm on. My work as a Christian counselor was dedicated to the abuse in people's lives. And I've, I've learned so, so much from women in the shelter who have gone through despicable things, but they are living, learning, growing, cleaning up their legacy, and have redeemed lives. You know, Jackie, I just feel that you are, are such a presence for anyone that is around mm. you. <laughs> and I'm sure you're an encouragement. I mean, I'm not I'm kidding. I mean, this, this woman is absolutely gorgeous. When I met you in November of 2022 at our Widow Might um, Novembering um, luncheon, I remember thinking, she is so beautiful. And we're going to have a picture going along this uh, with this podcast because you've got the best skin. Oh. I need to interrupt you until what are you doing to your skin? She does not have one wrinkle on her beautiful face. I have my mother. To <laughs> this think. is where we have girl talk. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> my only secret is Jergens Glow. Really? Every day. Yeah. Jergens Glow. It's just a, it's a cream that you can put on any part of your body. Mm-hmm. But especially in the winter, I have pasty skin. So I put a little Jergens oh, Glow and that's well, all I do. I'm just doing an, a, a little, a little um, commercial for your amazing skin tone. <laughs> um, okay, so, but, but you're talking about the dwelling place. But, but and, and my purpose for bringing that up again, too, is they see God through you. Oh. And to have a faith-based person who's mm-hmm. gone on a grief walk and knows what trauma is. Yeah has got to be a godsend for them. Mm -hmm. I think what makes it credible when you deal with anybody who's what we would consider in the margins of life is to be credible is to be real. Mm -hmm. And it's for me, I I have to be who I am. I can't be someone else's version of who I am. And that's my program at um, my clinic where I work in Roseville. I wrote a program called Peace and Safety in Your Heart and Home, and it's based on Isaiah 32, 18, and where God says, My people shall live in peaceful dwellings, secure homes, and undisturbed places of rest. Yes. And in the abuse cycle, that's not the case. And so we try and unwind the cycle for the person who is coming for care. And oftentimes it does mean a lot of other changes in their lives. At the shelter, they come to us from despicable situations they they're rescued out of them basically or they rescue themselves we have done a lot of work they've been partnering with us for a for a long long time and miracles take place at the dwelling place they do Mm -hmm. they do teach a support group there every friday and then i see um the women one-on-one um on thursdays so i love that work so much nothing shows transformation like a woman if i would we do, we do now take pictures of them when they come in. We didn't originally, but we take pictures of them when they come in. And then when they leave on graduation, profound difference in... Oh my God, I got chills. Mm-hmm. 
where they come in in fear and no trust. And why should they trust us, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so we have to gain their trust and we have to love them and love them and love them and their kids. We just have to love them up every day and help them understand that they do have purpose and plan. So we have um, one woman now who's graduating who will be going on to seminary, and we're so, so proud of her. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, that's more than a 180. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a miracle 180. Oh, the staff there Um, is phenomenal. You know, I want to ask you, Jackie, what's it like for, you know, your your heart and your love for God it just shines through. And as a Christian counselor, how did you parallel going through your own grief and then taking mm-hmm. on, It's it's got to be a big deal to, to help others with their grief mm-hmm. at the same time? Well, I made a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> so <laughs> You were honest. <laughs> yes. If we back up um, quite a few years, I've had a long history of grief and many mistakes along the way. Um, In 1976 and 1977, I lost a brother and a sister to suicide. And having been the last one to speak to them, I had tremendous guilt. And I lived 22 years in anger. Anger at Mm. myself. I thought, well, I thought it was my husband and my kids, so I took it out on them. I was a very angry person. That was where I put my grief so I wouldn't have to feel it. So after 22 years, I had come to Northwestern to get a bachelor's degree in psychology And it was advised that if we were going to go further, we should get some help for things in our lives. Well, I thought, oh, I'd just been putting that off and putting that off. I was so afraid because my father was a World War II casualty uh, mental patient with paranoid schizophrenia. And he was never fit for living in our home since I was five. He would come back in and out of the house, but he was a scary guy. So um, when my brother and sister hit depression, they hit it through alcohol and drugs. And my brother had come home from Vietnam, just despondent. He was just having a really, really hard time and lost, you know, took his own life. He had tried it once Mm -hmm. and then come to live with us for a while and thought he was doing okay. And then just hit a really rough spot in his life and took his own life. And then so much loss. So my little sister, they'd had an argument that day. Then she felt guilty and she took her own life 18 months later. So mm. I had that history, and when I got my bachelor's from Northwestern, I decided it was time to go for help. It had been 22 years since the losses, and I went to this beautiful counselor, Beverly Welsh was her name, and I rattled off my story. Just bloom, 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 bloom. My one son says, Mom, you sound like a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> so I rattled oh off goodness. this story of what I had been through, and she just leaned over, and she said, She whispered to me, Jackie, when are you going to touch that pain? And I said, I am not. I am not going to touch that pain. And she said, why? I said, it will kill me. And I felt that. I honestly felt that the pain of their losses would kill me. I covered my pain with anger. And Mm -hmm. thus the Lord prepared me very well to deal with anger in my practice. So that's what peace and safety in your heart and home is about, healing from anger and abuse. But. On the other hand, I I made so many mistakes. I I was so wrong in the way I handled my grief, but it was all I had. I would was too but scared. Is there? Hmm, no, this is a dumb question. I was going. Is there a wrong way to handle grief? Obviously, um, there is, um, and you touched on it along mm-hmm. with addictions. Yes, you know, with, yes. with right in your family and things like that. Um, I don't mean to interrupt you. Well, you continue that thought, and then I have a question. Okay. Okay. Sorry. (laughs) That's okay. So that grief um, taught me much, and just getting help at that time, really, it softened me. I could understand compassion. I always understood it for others, but not for myself. I didn't. I mean, I led Bible studies as an angry woman. I was a totally different person outside of the house than I was inside. You know, I was always perfectionistic and after my kids for this, that, and the other thing, and too strict at times, too lenient at other times. So I went through so many stages. It was really messy. And then came to the realization that I had compassion for me. And that was a whole different ballgame. So now when I look at all the mistakes I've made and how I grieved poorly and some well, I, I've grieved well too, um, I just can receive and be with people and not be upset. Tears are always welcome. Um, any form of grief that needs to be expressed, I can be there. 
You know, um, I, I can picture, and, and, and you're probably very familiar with this too, you know, about how we should um, lead our life with our hands open yeah. and upraised, you know, and, and many times in my life too, my, my, my uh, fists have been clenched, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, and, and I'm mad and I had to deal with forgiveness in, yes. in my, after the death of my husband. Yes. And that was like, you know, the, the heavens open and the angels sang because <laughs> I had a very good grief counselor too Aww. at that time. But we were talking about grief and it's so easy to mask that yeah with substance abuse and things how do mm-hmm. how do you what do you say to your clients mm-hmm. who are maybe going through something like that yeah i think that's a common thing you know um having something other than something to do or drink or eat to comfort oneself is a natural process but it does interfere with true grief work if it's obsessive or if it's addictive. So uh, addictions go hand in hand a lot of time with a grief that's not being helped, mm-hmm. where there's no helper involved. Um, but you try and help them understand what would be healthier for them and point them to addiction recovery for mm-hmm. sure. When it gets to that point, I know that you've really suffered greatly too when your husband was struggling with the same kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. So you've been through that portion where you kind of lose them slowly. You know, exactly. I say he, he, he died in um, August of 2005, but I, but I lost him in like 2002 when it all began and um, became more like his mom, you know, than, than a wife, you know, and Mm -hmm. locking up pills in a, in a tackle box, Mm -hmm. you know, because he would, he would, he would go find them. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, my anger grief, you know, and then would like you coming out the other side. And then the, the important phrase, and I've I've said it before too, is, you know, you can love, you can love John, you can love your spouse, but you can hate the addict. Yeah. Right on. (laughs) So good. That's so freeing, isn't Mm -hmm. it? Right. And, And just knowing that it's a torturous life to be addicted to anything because yeah. you're always preoccupied with the next fix or, you know, yeah. the next whatever you've chosen. Um, and that's not a full life. I call it a half life yeah. where we live for the externals, not the internal. I, I remember going to a family week and we did that a few times at different places um, for addiction recovery. And I, I was also mad there too. Cause I'm like, when, when do I get to have at him? When do I get to yell at him? And they're like, no, you don't. They feel bad enough already. <laughs> they do. I'm like, Oh, but what about me? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You feel this loss, you know, mm. the person is still there by your side, but the communication isn't what it should be. The love bond, isn't what it should yeah. be and your loss of dreams is huge in addictions yeah mm-hmm. uh, jackie sco christian counselor and all around superstar is my guest here on a widow's heart and and what what are your um what is your perspective on getting counseling is it too mm-hmm. early to go right away do you have to go through the fog the widow mm-hmm. fog that we say or or because i know some some people who have gone in uh, gone to a grief group, you know, like two weeks after. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to say it's wrong, but is mm-hmm. there a, a, a right time? Well, I love to say that whenever you have the time, why don't you drop in? Because if you make it a must, sometimes that's just another job that I can't do right now, you know, mm. and then you don't absorb. So I, I always try and take a lighter approach. And when you're ready, I say, um, you know, and you'll yeah. know you're ready when Maybe your support systems aren't able to help you as much. And when you maybe are preoccupied staying up all night or, you know, in some way filling your life with something that's not productive, then you probably want to go and just check us out. So I think there's always a right time. It's just when you decide that is the right time. So I myself was a couple months after my husband died, like three, four months I went reluctantly and I thought I'll go to one and then, you know, I'll probably Mm -hmm. check out. But I loved it so much right away because not only do you see good, credible information, but you get a chance to share and hear other people's stories too. And and also too, I always underscore a Christian counselor. Yeah. Christian Christian counselor. counselor Because without, without our savior, Mm -hmm. without Jesus, how and, and, and the promises that we have mm-hmm. that we grieve differently, how else could you get 
through this. Right. You know, I've had an experience around that that's kind of interesting. It depends on what your insurance is and and where you go, but I identify as a Christian counselor, so my practice is built on that. But um, when I went 22 years after the deaths of my siblings to get a Christian counselor, the insurance I had said to me, well, we don't know how you define Christian, so we can't guarantee you that. What? Right. Oh, my God. Goodness. So what I said was then I need someone who's going to respect my Christian beliefs so that I can process that way. And they said, we'll find someone for you. And okay. it was a perfect match. The woman that I, I got was great. I still see, I've seen three counselors um, over time and I'm still seeing one because unfortunately my oldest son, Brian, died in um, 2020, right at the beginning of COVID. It wasn't COVID, but it was the same kind of death. He had a mm-hmm. different father because he was uh, my firstborn child, but I wasn't married. Mm-hmm. And my fiance, when he found out I was pregnant, his other fiance showed up. There were two <laughs> fiancés and he ran off and married her and left me behind. Jackie, oh, so, my goodness. That's a grief. Too. That's a grief. You beat me to it. Mm-hmm. So I, so young. Yeah. yeah, I had to give up my first son because my mom had been a single mom, essentially, with my father's illness, raising four children. My youngest sister had just graduated from high school, and she said, I, I can't start over. And so the decision was mm-hmm. made to bless someone else with um, my child. And I struggled greatly. Um, didn't make the decision until a couple weeks before he was born, and then grieved that for... 22 years. So when I finished Northwestern, I could get credit for things that I had experienced um, from the time I left school in 68. And this is University of Mm -hmm. Northwestern St. Paul, right? Right, right. Wonderful. So I wrote this essay talking about um, the gift of surrender, and it's kind of a play on words. So I gave the gift of my child to a family who couldn't have them because I surrendered my parental rights. Yeah. So, but we were, when I wrote for that information, then the agency called me, it was Lutheran Social Services, and they said, do you, would you want to re-register, you know, if your son's looking for you? What they didn't tell me is he'd been looking for 15 years. Oh, we need a movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell me more. So we were reunited, um, and right before his golden birthday, which was May 30th, and it was wonderful. It it was the dream I had had ever since the day I gave him up because I had three things I asked for, that he not be um, adopted in the Twin Cities because I felt like I'd be looking for him every time, mm-hmm. that he'd have a Christian family and that he'd be brought up in the faith. And all of that happened. He was a um, worship director at a church in um, Grand Forks. <laughs> and it was his dream oh, job. He love. was very, very happy. Um but he died of a massive heart attack, which he didn't he didn't know he had heart disease. Oh. And it was a shock. How old was he? He was fifty two. Oh. So it was hmm. sudden and, and unexpected. And I remember when his aunt called me and told me about that. I couldn't believe it. Again, you know, um trauma's cumulative. And so one trauma Is it? I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. You have residual for trauma. I need to make an appointment with you. <laughs> oh, so gee. that, that yeah. you know, was another place of grief and loss that was unexpected, traumatic, wasn't there, couldn't say goodbye. You know, in, in all of the deaths that I've been talking about, there was no chance to say goodbye. There was no chance to hug him and kiss him, tell him you love him again for my husband or my son or my brother and sister. Mm. And and my mom and dad had passed by that time too. But uh, what what is so such a wonderful piece is that I know that the family that got my son loved him so much, loved him uh, to the point where he he was a su- successful musician and just a really nice man, very nice man. So um, we were able to have a funeral, and my sons went with, and my sister, my sister Kathy has been. Did, did his half-brothers and, and other mm-hmm. family know him? Mm-hmm. And stuff? Mm-hmm. Beautiful. They did meet. Yeah. And the funniest thing, they all laugh alike. And it was the sweetest <laughs> thing that Lord, the Lord had preserved that. But the Lord had, had preserved his voice. My mother was a soloist, and so he got her pipes, I figure. But um, he had left, he and his pastor recorded 60 hymns 
prior to his death, just old, you know, the old rugged cross. And I, that was given to me, the, the recording of his, his 60 hymns. So in the morning, I sing with him. Priceless. God gives me a, a song every morning. And Priceless. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a visit. Jackie Skog, um, you are amazing. I am, I'm in awe of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Um, we are not done yet, but <laughs> no. I just wanted to um, thank you so much for just being so transparent and, and sharing your gift. What uh, encouragement do you have for someone who might be listening right now who maybe it's been a week a month, two months, maybe, you know, just the year of first. Mm -hmm. What encouragement do you have for them? I think what comes to mind is, I think it's Nicole C. Mullen, who's recording of The God Who Sees. Mm. God saw Hagar. God sees you in your most desperate hour. God sees us. He knows us. Perhaps he's the only one that knows us better than we know ourselves. But he sees and he's present. I've been practicing this presence of God and taking breaks during the day to just breathe and practice. Okay, Jesus is here. He's my friend. He's not going to leave me. You know, what does he want right now? That that sort of thing. I would encourage you to do that, to know that he's closer than your breath and he wants to inhabit all parts of your life. Maybe your family's a mess because things didn't go well in the end. Maybe people are fighting about where you did the funeral or whose name got in the obituary. I mean, these stories go on and on. I see quite a few people who come to me because of family controversy. They're not only grieving, but they're having a mess of a time with their family. So I would say he knows that too. And if you lean on him, he'll, he'll give you what you need. He'll help you through you part the waters so to yeah. speak or part the relatives maybe <laughs> <laughs> oh that is so good tell me the name of the um you said that you had a um is it a bible study mm-hmm. on your website what what is that again what's your what's your website people are going to want to learn more about you uh peaceful and is my website and my notebook or my my study is called um peace and safety in your heart and home and It's in several different versions. I really haven't published it um, on my website. I do classes at the shelter. I do a 25-week course of Peace and Safety in Your Heart and Home. And then at my clinic, I do 12 weeks, and I do men and women separately. Okay. And I've done court-ordered people um, in the past, and so um, as a fulfillment of their probation. Um, is what else did you want to touch on mm. here before we wrap up? I just think there's so many ways people have losses and we live kind of limping with some losses where we don't talk about them. So uh, I just wanted to touch on other forms of grief that someone doesn't really die, but your dream dies, your dream of a marriage or a child um, achieving a certain success, or maybe someone's been handicapped in the process and we're living a grief that we can't talk about. So mm-hmm. there's grief about leaving. That can be divorce. That can be just mentally tuning out or mental illness or physical illness. Yeah. There's a real That's grief. That's a lot. That's mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of grief. Yeah. It is. It covers a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And then there's a deceiving where someone in your love relationship or your family has lied to you and you know they're leading a double life. And we see this in pornography all the time. I think a lot of what is so painful in marriages nowadays is the presence of pornography and things that distract from the marital bond, which is supposed to be sacred. Um, So I think there's a lot of people living a, a silent grief. I have three, four people in my life that that I just adore that have lived with various forms of grief. Um, one is my, my best friend, Janet, and she is someone who has grieved um, a divorce twice and still resilient, still absolutely vital and such a good friend for me. And then um, we have a friend, Bobby, who's been hit, widowed twice. Her um, first husband, she was, she was widowed in her forties and she had children to raise Um, And then she married again and second husband was Alzheimer's. So that was the slow grief Mm. illness first. And then um, Alzheimer's, which was that what I talked about earlier, 
where you lose part of them yeah. successively. She's so resilient. She's in prayer ministry, has never given up, you know, her, her spot in ministry. Um, and, and she's going to be 90 this year. So oh. she's an amazing resilient. You would never know it. You would never know. Yeah. And then um, another friend whose name I really can't man- man- mention today because hers is a silent grief, but her husband died of suicide. Yeah. And that's a whole different grief. You learn, I learned that as soon as I brought up the names of my, my siblings who had passed away through suicide, conversations stopped, people turned away. We don't like to go there. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and there are things in people's lives that they're living with that are very, very painful. So we're all suffering in one way or another, and I think it's worthy for us to remember that. When someone drives fast past you on the highway, don't curse them out, pray for them. When mm-hmm. someone is rude to you, they're probably dealing with something really tragic or sad that they haven't talked about. I think silent grief is a particularly painful place for people to be. And I think there's a lot of that going on. If you can talk about it, you can find support. I believe. Yeah. Well, Jackie, Jacqueline, uh, we talked about earlier spelled Mm -hmm. just like my mom, the French way, Jacqueline, or my dad says Jacqueline, (laughs) I like that. Skog, S K O G, and again, your website is uh, peacefulandsafe.com. Of course, we're going to have more of this on our um, A Widow Might Facebook page, and I'd love to have you back as as a guest again Mm. in in the near future because you are just a fount of wonderful Christian knowledge and um, I think helps so many people with our short time together. Mm, Well, thank you. I think we can only be what God has created us to be. And I don't want to miss a minute of what he's created me to be. I don't think I fully know that yet, but I'm on that search to find and do. Well, one last thing. Can I ask you to please pray for Mm. all of us? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your name to the airways today. Thank you, Lord, that you have been so personally present to me throughout my life. And that today, that I'm in awe of you and what you are doing, not only in me, Lord, but in those who I serve, in those who I see who struggle greatly, but also who find you as a source of their healing and their life purpose. So I ask now just a blanket of your holiness to cover the airways that we're speaking to today, to bring people back, anyone who's been lost through grief or loss, to assure them that you're close to them in their brokenness. You are more close to us sometimes in our weakness and our brokenness than we ever know in our other life in the other parts of our lives. So I pray that the ministrations of your holiness go far and wide today, Lord, and we will proclaim your name as great and holy and awesome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Father God, I just want to lift up uh, my new friend, Jackie. What a light. Your light shines so brightly through her, despite all of the things she's gone through. And we know that um, you are with us no matter what we are going through. I just pray for everyone listening um, that they will pick up that um, that amazing faith that she has uh, through you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pam. Jackie is such a a gem. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Pam Lundell. I want to leave you with a thought from Ephesians chapter 4, talking about love and how to love each other. Verse 29 says, speak good things to each other. No corrupting talk coming from our mouths. And verse 32, get rid of negativity. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And uh, I keep forgetting to mention to you, we have a Facebook page. Uh, I, last time I looked, almost 800 members. So I encourage you to uh, join, to follow A Widow's Heart on Facebook and get in on the conversation there. A Widow's Heart, grateful for the support of Wings for Widows and is part of the Wow God Podcast Network. You'll find A Widow's Heart wherever you get your podcasts and at wowgod.com.